Okay. Frank, what's your full name? Frank Huffman, Jr. Okay. Sit up, okay. I'm sorry. Try again. It's okay. I mean, I, we won't need that for the... You can keep that. Okay. When and where were you born? Born in Scott County, Kentucky, Georgetown, Kentucky. Okay. March uh, the 3rd, 1931. Did you enlist or were you drafted into the I, service? I enlisted. And uh, what was the, was there an occasion which made you want to enlist? Were we in a conflict? Yes. I had studied at school how our founding fathers had thought and gave their life for the freedom that we so enjoy. And I always, I wanted to go in World War II and I wasn't old enough, but I just always felt my heart, it was a d duty if you lived this country to be willing to lay your life down for this country. Not many feels that way, but I always mm. felt that way. Had the Korean War begun? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, what branch of service did you get? I was in, in the Army. Army. Um, where did you do your basic training? Fort Knox, Kentucky. Okay. So it wasn't too far away from home then, was it? No, but I knew I'd be going further. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What kind of training did you have? What kind I of I had uh, combat infantry training. And so that's what you were going to do, right? I thought it was. Oh, so uh, did the training come in handy or did you get give you a different job? Well, they saw on papers where I I quit school at 15, started driving a truck year before I was old enough to get licensed. I thought it was going to an infantry union unit. They throw me in a tank outfit, and I've never even been in a tank. Mm -hmm. That's a gospel truth. Yes. What was your uh, job in the tank unit? I started out as a driver. I worked my way up to tank commander. Mm -hmm. Now, were you good at driving large vehicles at that time, or did you learn? All I'd ever drove was coal trucks, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you get your... Uh, Tank training also at Fort Knox? I never did have tank training. Never been in one. I'm not telling you. Mm. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. So how long were you in the, the tank training in the United States, or in the tank unit in the United States? I wasn't in a tank unit in the United States. I took combat infantry training. Mm -hmm. Fort Knox, Kentucky, D-13 Armed Infantry Battalion. Took me up on line at dusky dark, Captain Orville Belcher. His driver had rotated out. I was his replacement. He said, we're going to be moving about three days to a different front. You're my driver. I said, sir, I ain't never been in a tank. He said, you better get in and get familiarized. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that's on front line. So he must have had confidence that I know something about a vehicle or so you were in Korea in your unit when they put you in the tank for the very first time. Huh? You were in your, with your unit in Korea when they put you in a tank for the very first time. Right. Wow. Well, did you learn quickly? Yes, I did. Had three of them blowed out from underneath them mm -hmm. and a tank, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I am a well number one off every time. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of times the danger because the belly's all full of ammo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many people uh, does it take to run a tank? Five. And what are their jobs? You've got a driver, assistant driver, the loader, the gunner, and the man stands up, the tank commander. Mm -hmm. uh, how big it is, is it inside a tank? <laughs> we were still running the M4A3E8 Sherman tanks that Patton had in World War II. Hmm. So, See, back then, there was nothing computerized. You couldn't do what I did today. I mean, you have to have training for this, training for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how many, uh, in this new tank unit you were in, how many tanks were there? We had five tanks to platoon. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, you said it was the captain who put you in there. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Was he part of that tank crew? Oh, he was a company commander. Okay. Yes. But he wasn't in your he, tank? Yeah, he was. Oh. He was commander at that time. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And uh, did you see a lot of action in your tank with your uh, yes, commander? Yes, uh, What was that like? Well, you don't know if you're going to make it back or not, but I've got a story right here come out a few years ago. Most deadliest three-day battle, September 6th. 7th and 8th, Hill 717-682. And that was in 1951, right? Yes, sir. September the 6th. Mm -hmm. And you were part of that? Yes, we supported the 35th Regiment of the 25th Division. Mm -hmm. In uh, your experience, were you in... Uh, Firing against positions, or were there tank-on-tank -tank, uh, conflicts, or we took out anything that we could, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, how um, in your your ta there were five tanks in your tank platoon? Is that yes, true? sir? Did you lose any of those? We lost two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know nothing about this picture till a few years ago. I was told Associated Press when he took this. Uh, of course, my parents at that time, they didn't get no paper. And that came out in the Lexman paper. We'd go high as 10, 12 miles behind enemy lines and try to destroy all we could at about daylight and hope we'd make them back out. That was took the associate, I believe, associate press, the army. And yeah. that's you in the, in the in the tank there. I was driver then. Yeah. That's been a long time ago. What was the uh, when you were in your tank? What was the weather like in that part of Korea where you were at? Well, the winter '51, it got 30 below. We had boys froze to death, literally. I got my feet frostbite, but that's part of serving this great country. Mm -hmm. There's no kind of comfort heater in the tank, or? Huh? There's no kind of heater in the tank for the occupants, or nothing like a, so, you know, you're on, you're, you're cold and you're cold inside the tank, too. Okay. Yeah, you ain't got no heat. Yeah. <laughs> now, in the uh, when it was time to camp for the night or something, did you stay in the tank or did you go outside the tank? Uh, oh, we had bunkers that we when we set up a defensive perimeter, mm -hmm. we had bunkers that we stayed on guard 100 percent all the time. Yeah. Two two guys, yeah. So you not you know when you're out of the tank, someone has to protect protect the tanks, right? Huh. Make, Protect the tanks. Make sure the enemy doesn't get to them while you're not we don't, in. We don't want, you don't want to get overrun. No. I had a, a safe conduct pass. A lot of folks had never saw. What was the uh, name of your tank unit? Huh? The name of your tank unit, what was the? Uh, we was the 89th tank, 89th medium tank battalion. APO 25 San Francisco Ed was our, uh, was our address. We must all, here it is, we must always remember that freedom is never going to be free. Mm. If a morning come daylight, the ground would be snow white covered. Mm -hmm. See, we've still got 7,600. We had 8,100, but Kim Jong-young's dad or grandfather let us go in and look for remains, and 
but we're down to 7,600. And it come daylight of the morning, they would shoot them out more than artillery rounds to get you surrender. Yeah. Hmm. They call it a safe conduct. Yeah. We'll give you free clothing, food, yeah. When, uh, how long were you in Korea in combat? I had 10 months and 21 days in front line duty. Now, did that front line move quite a bit during those 10 oh, months? Oh, yes, yes. We moved constant, one front to another. Mm -hmm. How far north did you actually get? We was above Pyongyang. Well, that's the capital. Yeah, this took place in what was known as the Iron Triangle. Kumwa, Chorwan, and Pyongyang. Mm -hmm. They called it the Iron Triangle. Mm -hmm. What was a, a typical day for you in your uh, tank platoon? You just, you just tense all the time, just hoping to make another day. Mm -hmm. What were the, uh, the Chinese, did you go against Chinese and North Korean troops? Oh, yes. Uh, what kind of uh, tanks did the Chinese have? They had what Russia had sent over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did they compare to the tank you were in? I don't think it was. We had M48s over there, which a bigger tank than, but that Sherman tank for it. It was a battle wagon because it went through World War II and mm -hmm. still used it in Korea, you know. Did you ever work with the uh, South Korean Army in a, in a particular conflict? I worked with all of them. Mm -hmm. Do you have much contact with the South Korean people? Civilians? Well, at times, you, do, you don't speak their language, and mm -hmm. you know, they'd wave at you as they was fleeing, mm -hmm. going south. That Rock Army was a powerful army. They had discipline. Mm -hmm. Now, you call it the Rock Army. Is that for? Uh, Republic of Korea. Korea. Yes. And that's the South Koreans? Yes, or, sir. OK. The Turks were the one that was barbaric. Mm -hmm. That was their trophy. They may have 100 ears. That, 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 that's always bothered me. Leave mm -hmm. the dead alone. Mm -hmm. Barbaric. You say these were the Turks? Yes. From Turkey. See, we had 19 different countries fighting. Mm -hmm. It was something unusual about Korea. It was the first time a jet plane was ever used in combat. First time a helicopter, funny looking thing to what we have compared today. And first time the UN troops fought alongside. But you go down the road and see a bunch of dead bodies and no ears, I know who had been there. And they would meet you, they'd string them on a wire. That was a trophy. I don't call that a trophy. Leave the dead alone. Did you uh, ever have uh, any R&R &R during your uh, time in Korea? Yeah, they let us go six. We went six days to, uh, to Tokyo. Yeah. And yeah, we had a good meal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Instead of sea ration. Mm -hmm. Now, do they fly you over there to Tokyo? For the R&R, &R, or how did you get Yes, they, they flew us, but we went to Korea by ship and come back by ship. Mm -hmm. Troop trained to get there. See Vietnam, they flew everybody. Yeah. They changed. When did you leave uh, Korea? I got back to the States, I think it was around uh, Mother's Day of 52, yeah. Was the conflict still going on? Oh yeah, it didn't end until July 53, really. Mm. Yeah. And when you got back to the United States, what, uh, we were still in the military for a while? Oh yes, I, I become first sergeant at Fort Knox, Kentucky. We were still training them to go to Korea. Mm -hmm. The thing got worse after I left over there for mm -hmm. a while, you know. I'd seesaw back and forth, back and forth. Now, you said you were there uh, during the winter when it got 30 below. Uh, were you there in the summer, too? And yeah. what yeah. kind of weather was it then? 
it'd get 95 or 100, 90 percent humidity. Mm -hmm. Ain't had a bath for a month. Mm -hmm. Mosquitoes. I, I took everything they ever gave me, and I'd only been back a month. And I come down with malaria. I was hospitalized for seven or eight days at Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. That's bad stuff, malaria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Only, only the queen mosquito, they said, could give you that virus. Hmm. Of course, they use human waste in those rice paddies. That's where you can get all this dreaded diseases and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now you say when you came back to the United States, you trained future uh, tank drivers to go over there. Is that correct? Well, no, I came back to the same infantry unit. Well, did you? Did you really? So, I sure did. So all of a sudden, you're no longer in the tank again. Right. I guess they just trusted it. They needed a driver, and I guess they just had felt that I could do it. I don't know. Was it hard to adjust being back in the infantry unit? No, no, not, not, not really. Mm -hmm. Here I'd, I'd learn a lot in the tank outfit over there. Now I'm coming back, back to infantry, but I hadn't forgot what I was taught in infantry, mm -hmm. you know. Now the other men in the infantry unit, were they veterans like you or were they new recruits? No, this was new recruits when I come back. Mm -hmm. We were still training them. And how old were you at this time? I was uh, 20. Yeah, I done turned 20. And so you're the 20 year old old vet who knows what it's all about. And you've got these green recruits listening to you, right? How old were you when you enlisted? Or I was 19. 19? Yeah. yeah. And how long did you have, how long was your uh, full enlistment? I I did five year uh, in reserve. I wish I'd have stayed in, but that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> you always look back, you know? Yeah. yeah. When you think back of your service, not only in Korea, but also in Fort Knox and other places, how does that make you feel? Well, I'd often wondered. I worked out Matthew 25 ministry voluntary work three days a week. And just about two months ago, I have a sitting job because my back's gone, my knee's gone. My hands still work and my mind is clear as when I was 16 years old. And I was sitting there working and the lady cleared her throat and said, the young man wants to talk to you. I looked up, I tell he was Korean descent, had on glasses, probably 14, 15 years old. It's the first one I'd ever told me that. And he put his hand out and he said, I wanna thank you for helping liber liberate my country. And I just figured that probably his grandparents was killed over there. Of course, he, I could tell he was American born, you know. Mm -hmm. But he had studied and knows what what went on, but it make you feel proud, really, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a, you consider the whole experience a, po a positive in your life then? Oh yeah. yeah. I've often wondered, did we really do good? But when the president of South Korea sent us a big hardback book, and the 50th anniversary, and showed the massive buildings and how far they had came from nothing. Yeah. Well, Frank, I want to thank you for sharing your story and I thank you for your service and I want to thank you for still serving other people today. I'm honored. I've had people say, would you do it again? I said, yeah, if I, if I was a young feller. George Horston was always my hero if you ever saw a picture, he was always, he prayed before he went into battle. Mm -hmm. And one of his great quotes, it is rightly impossible to govern America without God and the Bible. We kick both out and then wonder why this country's in a, such a turmoil. Mm -hmm. You know, anything goes today. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
But I was honored to serve this country. Thanks again, Frank. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, Frank, I want to go back to when you made that transition from being a coal truck driver to a tank driver. In those first days, what was that like? Well, like he said, you better get in there and get familiarized. And I'd watch the guy down home run the laterals on a bulldozer, and I thought, hmm. Yeah, make a left turn, pull a left and pour the coal to it. And <laughs> so it's kind of like a bulldozer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you have any accidents? Did you run into anything? No. No, except in a tank, man. It's three of them stacked that deep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. And? Oh, sometimes it even caused your nose to bleed such a jar. Whenever you hit something so powerful, it picks a tank, pull them up off the ground, it weighs 70,000 pounds. It's powerful. Yeah, it's just powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got a picture somewhere where... John, what's your full name? Full name? The yeah. whole thing? The whole Middle thing. name and everything. Hmm. John Benton Tonkin. Where and when were you born? I was born in New Philadelphia, Ohio, 1937. Did you enlist into the military or were you drafted? I enlisted right out of high school. And fact, I was, when I, was that? 1955. Why did you enlist, John? Uh, jobs were scarce. And uh, that was a job that I knew I could get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what branch did you go into? The Marine Corps. And what was how, what was, how long was your commitment? I was in three years. I had an eight-year commitment at that time. That you, the, the uh, what, what they call it, Universal Military Training Act was in force. And uh, it was an eight-year commitment, uh, active duty plus reserve time. Mm -hmm. And I served, so I served three years active duty and what, five years inactive reserve. Mm -hmm. Where did you train? Paris Island, South Carolina, okay. my favorite place. Uh, did you have a specialty training after basic? Went to, well, everybody goes to infantry training regiment. And then from there, I went to uh, the 1st Battalion, 10th Marines, which is an artillery regiment for the 2nd Marine Division. And they, for some reason, decided I would be a counter battery radar operator. Counter battery, what does yeah. counter battery mean? The function of the counter battery radar was to track incoming artillery or mortar rounds, and then uh, through a truck, truckload size computer, we could backtrack the round and plot where it came from and call that, those coordinates to our outgoing artillery to try to neutralize that. Okay, so this was uh, relatively new technology at that time. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah. it was. A tractor paper about 36 inches wide and <laughs> plexiglass fans that we had to spread out. I, I don't remember all of it, but it was a, yeah, it, but the computer took the back of a two and a half ton truck. <laughs> uh, where did you do that training for counter battery radar? Down, down at Camp Lejeune, North Camp Carolina. Lejeune, okay. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, did you uh, end up being used in that position or like the military where you're given something else to do eventually? Well, um, what happened was in, I think 1956, there was uh, some ruckus going on in the Middle East. I don't remember exactly what it was, but they decided that they would, uh, Eisenhower decided he would send a second Marine division as a show of force. And we got all excited about that. And then the, uh, our commander came in and said, you guys aren't going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so eight of us got left behind. Um, and we- But the rest of the unit went? Yeah. Well, Except they for eight people. They boarded ship, but they never got to the Mediterranean. They went out and sailed around the Atlantic for a while and then came back, but we didn't know that at the okay. time. Um, but we hang, hung around there in the barracks for a while and were putting in for transfers to whatever we could get. And uh, so ultimately, after a few weeks, I was transferred to, uh, of all places, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. <laughs>
Well, before we get to how you got to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, what was so different about the eight people who didn't get the goon? We were just counter-battery radar, and apparently they didn't have room for us on the LST. Yeah. With the artillery and all the associated stuff that went with it, they didn't have room for our radar yeah. set and our computer. And now, of all places, you said Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Explain, please, why that is so unusual. Well, we were a, we were a, a, a barracks of Marines on uh, the home base of the 101st Airborne Division, which is an Army unit. <laughs> and uh, historically, we don't get along real well. <laughs> so it was kind of a, a shock when I found out where I was going. I, I didn't know that until I got there, but a <laughs> little bit of a shock. Now, as I recall, uh, some of the people on the base were also shocked that you were there. Yes. Yes, um, I think I shared that story with you earlier that I got to Clarksville, Tennessee, which is just across the Kentucky line from Clarks, uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, <coughs> and asked a taxi driver to take me to Clarksville base, and he said there wasn't such any, there wasn't any such place, and which was a little disconcerting. And I asked the second taxi driver, and he said, you mean the birdcage? And I said, oh, well, I, I, I guess. So we get out to the Fort Campbell gate. The, the uh, gate guard wouldn't let him in until he saw my orders, and he told the, the cabbie where to go. And the cabbie stopped about 200 yards from the gate and said, this is where I stopped, get out. Hmm. So I lugged my stuff a couple hundred yards into this little teeny guard station, and these two big Marines came out, and they said, what do you want? <laughs> and I showed them my orders, and they said, okay, go go on in and I had no idea I had no idea what was going on hmm. didn't know why I was there or what they were doing or anything now you refer to this as a barracks yes uh, how many people how many Marines about 200 there was a um, two platoons of working guard and a headquarters platoon do you did you ever find out why Marines were at a, at a I, I know what you did but why were Marines at this army base it became an air, a naval administration station, and the Navy was the uh, the top dog. We had a captain. Captain Carpenter was the base commander. Mm -hmm. And when the Navy has a shore situation like that, they always had Marine Guard. So that's and, where. And what did these 200, the, what was the main function of these 200 Marines? Security. It was all security. Security of what now? Of, of Clarksville Base, which is an eight-mile in circumference portion of Fort Campbell that uh, was surrounded by four chain link fences, one of which was electrified. And it, it was a super high security place. What was in the Clarksville base? Uh, atomic weapons. Of course, we didn't know that. We weren't supposed to know that. But mm. It was atomic weapons. And basically, it was a, it was a service function for detonators. Uh, they did a lot of that because at that time they had insert in flight detonators and they had to be routinely serviced because apparently the shelf life of some of those explosives uh, had to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and they used tritium and polonium and some other stuff that was pretty nasty. Mm -hmm. So they, the uh, Navy people did that down inside uh, deep underground bunkers uh, scattered all over that place mm -hmm. inside the eight mile circle. So the Marines are simply to guard this, but there's Navy personnel working on these weapons. Yes. Deep underground. And civilians, yeah. And civilians also. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was it, uh, what was your, uh, you were a guard then? Yes. What would be a, a typical, were you in a, in a little tiny guardhouse or were you on patrol or? Yeah, it, well, there were several stations. There were, I, I don't remember exactly how many, but, but a guard mount was about 40 people. Uh, there were some stationary guards, there were some roving patrols, um, and there, of course, the corporal of the guard, sergeant of the guard, and those people. And radio, we were all radio dispatched. Mm -hmm. uh, the perimeter, there were four patrols on the perimeter moving all the time, that went around the eight miles. Mm -hmm. And um, inside what they called the Q area, which is where the really high security stuff was, that only people with top secret clearances could go in. They had several roving patrols that would rove at random. And within that, there were several other uh, stationary guard stations mm -hmm. that people would be stationed at and not moving. 
Now, the, the barracks, which you were a part of, um, were they, what, several Marine barracks buildings next to each other? Well, or? barracks is, is, a, is a term that the Marine Corps uses. There, there is a detachment. There is a security guard unit. The security guard unit is the smallest. The detachment is the next biggest. And then the barracks is the next biggest. And then you get into companies, battalions, and oh, okay. divisions. So the barracks is simply something that says it's not quite a company, but it's, it's bigger than a platoon. Okay. <laughs> So the barracks, I mean, living-wise, uh, there was one separate barracks, yeah, one separate barracks, and then the other barracks was contained, for the other guys, was contained in the main administration building. Now, as far as your living quarters at uh, Clarksville Base, what, uh, what part of the secure area or were you? We were in the administrative area. Okay. You, you had to have a badge to get on the base, just on the base mm -hmm. at all. Um, and we were in that non-security, well, I called it non-security. Mm -hmm. It was a fairly insecure area. Mm -hmm. The real security was in what we called, the, what they called the Q area. And that had a separate gate, and you had to surrender your pass when you went in. They would give you, a, exchange your pass. And when you came out, you would give them their pass back, and you got your mm -hmm. badge back. So it was, and these yep. guys were armed with rounds in the chamber. <laughs> Did the guards on the outer gates and the guards on the secure gates, did they fraternize or were they kept separate? They were, well, they, off duty they fraternized, of course. Yeah. But while they were on duty, they were probably 100 yards apart, so they didn't, didn't talk much. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you were talking about how the cab driver didn't know where he was <laughs> going to take you. Did you find that true uh, about many of the uh, people on Fort Campbell and the surrounding area that they had no idea Marines were there? Yeah, it, it, in fact, it, up until this time, Fort Campbell does not know what went on at that facility. Um, I had occasion just in the last few years to run into an archeologist that was doing some work for the Army on Clarksville Base. There was a river or a creek, I call it a creek, mm -hmm. that ran through it and she was doing uh, archeological work on the banks because they had straightened the creek when it went through, mm. when they built Clarksville Base. And she got a hold of me and we met with her and uh, she said she had been through all the army records, all the photographs, everything she could find in the Fort Campbell Engineering Office and there was nothing. Nobody knew anything about what went on at, Fort, at Clarksville Base. On aerial photographs, it's blacked out. <laughs> so it was, Pretty serious business back in those days. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how long were you at Clarksville Base? Uh, from November of 56 to July of 58, so about a year and a half, I guess, mm -hmm. a little over. What would a typical day be for you at Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, a, a, you had day on, day off, because the, the, there were two companies of the guard mount. If A company was working, B company was off, and vice versa, of course. And when you were working, it was four on, eight off, mm -hmm. uh, seven days. <laughs> and uh, weekend, you get weekend on, weekend off. So a typical day is if you were working the day shift, you'd get out for guard mount about 7.15 and get the orders of the day, and then you would be trucked out to your guard station, wherever that might be, mm -hmm. and uh, relieve the guy who was on duty. And you were on for four hours, and then somebody would relieve you at the end of those four hours. And you were off eight hours, and you do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. Were you usually at a guard station, or did you sometimes patrol? Both, yeah. Mm. It was ba pretty much based on seniority. You, you know, the new guys got to stand this stationary stations because that mm. was miserably boring. Mm -hmm. uh, after you've been a while, for a while, they would put you in a roving patrol, and uh, that wasn't too bad. But the trucks were governored. And <laughs> what rank uh, were you when uh, when you were all finished with your guard duty there? Uh, I I went up to corporal, and then I, as I tell people, I made PFC twice. <laughs> I had a little fender bender accident, and uh, the, the uh, Marine commander, who was Colonel Walter Walsh, decided that he had had enough of that, and he said, I'm going to take a stripe away from him, and I said, that's okay. I said, i got a month and a half to go, and I'm mm -hmm. leaving anyway, so it's all right. Uh, did you have any, uh, well, off base, did you have any fraternization with some of the Army staff, uh, and they oh, yeah. asked you, why are you doing there, and they couldn't quite figure it out? They, they, they cautioned us routinely about talking to anybody outside. They said, you know, you don't even talk about this place. So the, the, we never got into conversations about what we did with the Army, and we got into a few 
discussions, you might say, with them, but uh, and a few heated discussions, but uh, never talked about what went on. Mm -hmm. um, they were a little fearful about what went on in there. They would come by in their convoys, and they were there was no signs all over the place that said no stopping, no photography. Mm -hmm. And if they had a flat tire, you know, the, the perimeter guard would say, "You got to move on." But well, we got a flat, move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they wouldn't let them stop to change it. Did you ever personally have to stop a vehicle from getting onto the? Uh, no, no. That, that gate security was pretty good. How about any flying over? Or was no, it was a no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of ironic because now it's the home of the Night Stalker helicopter squadron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to your knowledge, how long was uh, Clarkson Base in operation in this somewhat secretive position? Well, there were 13 of these scattered around the country. Uh, Clarksville Base was at the second one, um, and it, it opened in 1948, I think 1948 under the auspices of the Atomic Energy Commission at that time. Uh, and it closed officially in 1969. So it was all empty by that time. Mm -hmm. And they turned it back over to the Army, and the Army said, well, we don't know what, what are we going to do with it? We don't even know what it is. Yeah. That's a lot of concrete, mm -hmm. what it is. Any idea if the area was radioactive at all? No, um, it wasn't. They, uh, they had one spill of tritium, which is deadly and they had one fatality of a, f of a civilian uh, worker there but that was before I got there mm -hmm. um, they all wore radiation badges of course we didn't because we never went in inside mm -hmm. the structures um, and there were a lot of structures underground mm -hmm. they were all protected by uh, about 16 inch thick steel blast doors and every 60 feet there was another set of blast doors back into the hillside and uh, they had a complete hospital and barracks and everything was underground. I mean, I don't, uh, they could have lived there, I guess. And the one that was the most dangerous, they had built a structure on top of it that was solid concrete that was designed that if there were, ever was an explosion, it would collapse onto the explosion to contain it, hmm. which was interesting to me. But yeah. anyway, that's, it looked like a regular building windows and everything, but it was solid concrete. Mm. Now, you said there were some civilians working at uh, Clarksville Base. Did they live on the base or they live off base? They lived off base. The maintenance people were civilians, mm. but the people who actually worked on the weapons were mostly from Sandia Corporation in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. They would fly in, and I don't know how long they'd stay, but they'd work a while, and then they'd go back to New Mexico. Were there ever uh, convoys of weapons going in or things going out? We would have regular convoys. Um, at that time, uh, Campbell Air Force Base was across Fort Campbell from us, and it was a strategic, can't say that, strategic air command base. So we would haul the weapons across Fort Campbell to uh, Globemasters, basically, mm -hmm. and they would fly them who knows where. And then when they came back, we would go get them and bring them back, mm -hmm. maybe a different set. I don't know whether they kept moving these in a circle or what they did, but anyway. Mm -hmm. The convoys were fairly routine, and it would stop all traffic and any any troop movements on air, airborne troop movements on the road, stop, halt, turn around, don't look. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we got over to the airport, we always had to form a an outward facing perimeter around the airplane. Mm -hmm. I guess in case the Russians showed up, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, they would load their products or unload, depending on which way they went, and then haul them back. But they were machine gun mounted Jeeps. We, we so, you know, you're there at the airport looking out. So mm -hmm. you technically, you're not supposed to turn around and see what's going on. Right, right. right. But we did, you know. Yeah. And it, it, we didn't see anything. I mean, they were basically a trailer maybe eight feet long mm -hmm. and four feet wide, covered with a big canvas bag. So what was under the canvas bag, we never knew. I mean, for a long time, we figured it out, but we never knew and never looked. But they would go onto a, a little platform, and then the, the loading crew would elevator them up into the Globemaster, and away they went. Now, uh, when you're on this guard duty, are you wearing your, the, your basic combat Marine uniform? Yeah, or? yeah, utility uniform, yeah. 
And what weapon did you have? We, had, we all had M1 rifles. The uh, corporal of the guard carried sidearm, sergeant of the guard carried sidearm. Mm -hmm. But we all had M1 Garands with the rounds in the chamber. Mm -hmm. That was that was the instruction. Yeah. Did anything ever? Uh, well, you you mentioned guarding. Uh, did, is there any one uh, occurrence that is memorable? Something trying to get on, or animals doing something and setting off alarms, or no, there was, uh, in my little time there, uh, there was, the, the night I arrived, there was a bad accident. Um, and they used to have these things called alerts, which looking back on it was kind of ludicrous. But anyway, um, what, there was one platoon off duty that was always the alert platoon. And I don't know who called these things, but somebody would call an alert and these guys would go get their guns and get on the trucks and they'd zip down in the queue area. Mm -hmm. And they were doing that the night I got there, and you know I had no clue what was going on. And these three trucks went roaring by and down over the hill, and I disappeared. And mm -hmm. pretty soon, three ambulances went down over the hill. And what had happened is one of these trucks didn't make a turn and it rolled over, and killed a kid, mm -hmm. and hit another guy in the mouth with a machine gun, and did some other damage. But uh, that was, you know, I, I thought, what is this yeah. place, and what am I doing here? Yeah. You refer to it as the Q area. What is that? Yes. That's different. Just this is what they called it, Q area. Okay. And you you couldn't get in there unless you were cleared top secret. And so I had to wait maybe six months to get Q and clearance. You had this job for about two years. A uh, year, yeah, a little over a year and a half. Okay. When you left it, uh, did you have time left in your commitment? No, I was discharged from there. Okay. Went from there home. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how do you feel about your, your, your service in the Marines at this time? Which part of it? I, it well, the, um, <laughs> was was it a positive part of your life? Yeah, I think it, I think it was. I think it was. I, um, you know, you're 17 years old and you're in Paris Island, and, and on your birthday they march you to a movie, and the movie they show you is Battle Gr Battle Cry. I doing here? Yeah. But yeah, I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned I could do things that I didn't think I could do. Uh -huh. I could endure more than I thought I could. And uh, from that standpoint, it was good. Um, and, and Camp Lejeune was good. I, I learned a lot there. Mm -hmm. I learned to do uh, fire direction center stuff, which is you know where you call the guns and mm -hmm. say, shoot here, not there, <coughs> uh, As a, in, a, in addition to the radar stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But the Clarksville Bay stuff, not so much. Yeah. Why did you pick Marines? You want the truth? Yeah. <laughs> it was the only place I could get in for three years. The rest of them wanted four. <laughs> 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 no, actually, well, that was part of it. But I, when I was in the eighth grade, uh, we had to write a career booklet. And I wrote a career booklet based on a career in the Marines, which I really intended to pursue until I got in there. And I thought, no, nah, this isn't for me. This is, uh, too many people tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, John, thanks for sharing your stories with us, and, and thanks for your service. My pleasure, and you're welcome. Hmm. So John asked you, nothing unusual? I mean, you didn't run into any wayward deer? Or? Well, yeah, well, we had, yeah, we had uh, they, the deer got in there and they couldn't get out. Hmm. I never thought about that, but um, the deer population exploded in there. So we had to go in with bo big box, great big box traps and put carrots in them. And the deer would go in there and <laughs> close the door. And then we go mm. down there with trucks, two and a half ton trucks and load the boxes and take them out and turn them mm. loose on Fort Campbell. And I had a guy in a, maybe five or six years ago call me and his father had been a, a maintenance worker on Clarksville base. Mm and knew about the trapping. This guy that called me was his, uh, was a wildlife officer for the state of Tennessee. And he said, had it not been for Clarksville Base, he said, Tennessee may not have a deer population. He said, those deer repopulated the Tennessee deer. I said, are you serious? <laughs> he said, yeah, really. So I guess in that sense, it was a good thing. But there were a lot of deer, still are a lot of deer yeah. on that base. Now you said the, the, the last fence was electrified. No, there was, a, there was an outside fence let me think a minute. There were four fences. There was an outside, the outer fence, then the second fence was the electrified fence, 13,000 volts. Mm -hmm. Then the third fence was not, 
and that was beside the perimeter road, and then the perimeter road, then the, another fence on the other side of the perimeter road. Was there any ever, any issues with the electrified fence? Yeah, uh, a maintenance guy told me that they did lose a guy, a soldier. It was in, he had escaped from the stockade at Fort Campbell, and he thought he was getting out of Fort Campbell, climbing over the fence, and he hit that electrical fence. And obviously, he didn't make it. No. Um, but wildlife used to, in a rainstorm, wildlife would try to get under that fence and it would zap them. You know, but we had big floodlights that would go on. When any section of that fence would ground, these humongous floodlights would go on, so we'd mm -hmm. have to run down there. So you knew when something hit those fences oh, yeah. every time? Yeah, every time, every time. Yeah. There, there was an alarm station in the guardhouse, there was an alarm station in the queue area, and then, of course, the lights, the security lights went on. So mm -hmm. it was um, pretty tough to get in. <laughs> Does uh, Kentucky know about Fort Clarkson now? Yeah, there's a museum on Fort Campbell, uh, the Army Museum, and the curator there uh, is a retired, I think, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, I'm not sure, and, and he, he's advocating for a Cold War museum down inside Clarksville Base so mm -hmm. people can go in the, the uh, structures, as they call them. That would be neat. And, uh, it, it's it's kind of bizarre going in there, really. I mean, it's, this is a half moon shaped concrete tunnel, and you go back a long ways, and then they go off to either side. It's, hmm. it's kind of spooky, <laughs> with no lights. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the army, uh, as I say, the army still doesn't know what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And we had to sign a paper that we wouldn't talk about it for 50 years. So that's been beyond that. So. Yeah. All right. And they don't use those weapons anymore anyway. Yeah. So uh, we almost have a scoop with you then, right? Well, <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. There's no wayward moonshiners or hunters no. that got lost. Or no, I, I got a good friend who was, a, who was the Baker Company commander down there. I was an able company, so I never knew him down there, but he's a good friend now. Uh, and he said, he's a lieutenant colonel, retired as a lieutenant colonel, and he said, I never understood the mentality of having that kind of a guard force. He said, it was like we were going to have a, an attack from a division of Russians. And he said, if anybody yeah. was going to infiltrate that base, it would be one person. Hmm. And they would come in under some other identity. He said, it wouldn't be a gang of people. And he said, we were set to re repel <laughs> lots of people. Yeah. He mm -hmm. said, it was the dumbest thing you ever saw. <laughs> but anyway, that's what we did. Yeah. Thank you. It's a little classier than Lifetime sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mark, what's your full name? Uh, Mark S. Rezzo. Okay. Uh, when and where were you born? Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, 1948. Okay. Were you uh, enlisted or drafted into the U.S. service? Um, I enlisted. Okay. And when was that? Uh, December 13, 1968. 68. And why did you enlist? Um, well, <laughs> it's kind of a long story, but um, I had a dead-end job I really didn't like. Um, uh, didn't think I was going anywhere with that job, hated it. So when I got my notice to report for my physical, um, I went down and I thought I might as well just get this over. I know I'm in good health. So there's a E5 sergeant standing there, Army, and I said, uh, if I pass the exam, can I just sign up? And he said, well, sure, just hang around a while. So about an hour later, he came out and said, yeah, you passed the exam, which I knew I would. I was mm -hmm. 20 years old. So um, I said, when can I leave? He said, well, you can leave tomorrow morning if you want. And I said, well, I'd kind of like to stay home for Christmas. So he said, okay, report December 6th, or January 6th of mm. 1969. So. What branch of the service did you go Army. to? Army. Army. Yes. Where was your training? Uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, both for basic and AIT. And what was your AIT training? Uh, infantrymen, um, advanced and basic. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the Vietnam War was going on at correct, this time. Correct. And so you knew you were going to go over? Um, we had, uh, at first report, they told us we were going to Korea. Uh, the whole unit was going to Korea. Um, I told my drill sergeant um, I was not going to Korea. I told him I was going, I'd go to Canada before I went to Korea. 
as a joke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so our orders got changed and they sent us to Vietnam, not because of what I said, <laughs> but it's just how it happened. So. And uh, where in Vietnam did you go? Um, I was in the Central Highlands, the mountains, the center of uh, the north, uh, north part of the state. It's actually called Tu Cor. Um, and we were in the mountains um, my whole tour while we were over there. So, What was the unit you were in? I was with the 4th Infantry Division, 1st uh, of the 12th uh, Red Warriors, um, established um, during the Revolutionary War and been fighting in all the wars since. So. And what, what did the, the Red Warriors do? Um, we, were, uh, we moved as a company. Um, we were in the field full time. We didn't um, very seldom would go to a fire base or a support base. Um, we just uh, were out in the jungle, either blocking or moving uh, for ambushes or trying to locate the enemy. Mm -hmm. And we moved eh, eight to nine hours a day. We were on the move. So uh, you said there was no uh, bases you went to. So compared to many other soldiers in Vietnam, you were always in the heat of some sort of action? Yeah, we were always, um, always on the move. So. Um, we were chasing the enemy or blocking the enemy or ambushing the enemy, whatever, you know, particular job we had for that day or week or month mm -hmm. or whatever it may have been, so. What might a typical day be? Oh, a typical day was um, uh, the sun came up, you got up. Um, you ate. Uh, if you were sleeping under a, a, a poncho liner, uh, which we would make into a tent-like sleeping area, we'd tear that down um, and load up you know, all our equipment and supplies that we had with us and off we go in one direction or the other and stayed on the move until late in the afternoon, generally around, generally around five o'clock. Um, you lose track of time, but that's basically what we'd stop, set up our position, whatever we were doing, and then um, hold that position for that night. What, uh, what, what was the size? Was this a company? Uh, yeah, it was movement? a company. So we had anywhere from 90 to 100 people moving with us at any given time. And so there was nothing uh, resembling a camp with hot meals or no, no. things um, like that? We, uh, we had sea rations. Um, we got supplied um, every third or fourth day. A helicopter would drop us in our supplies. Um, once a month, they'd drop you fresh clothes. Uh, same way. Uh, if we weren't near water, they would drop us a large bladder to fill our canteens. But generally in the mountains, you were by a, a stream. So um, we usually just drank out of the mm -hmm. water out of the stream um, and treated it with a tablet that would kill any bacteria in the water. Did uh, your platoon do anything on its own sometimes? Yeah, at night what they would do is you would set up your perimeter and then you would send four listening posts out, which be, be, would be three men. And then um, they went out in all four directions, obviously north, south, east, and west. And they would be typically about 500 yards out was about typical. And you would leave just as the sun was setting. So if anybody was watching your movement, you would conceal your location basically. And you would just sit there all night and listen. That's why they called them you know, LPs, listening posts. Mm -hmm. um, and you would call back into the company if you heard movement or suspected you had something out there. So, Did you ever uh, work with the South Vietnamese Army on any kind of uh, maneuver? We did, uh, and we had, um, um, we would block for them. They would drive the enemy into us, and we were a blocking unit at that time. Um, so as they moved, pushed, say, north to south, we would be sitting there waiting for them on a trail or, mm -hmm. you know someplace we suspect that they may be moving into. Um, but we didn't make, didn't have much contact with them. Um, we did have um, a couple of the Kit Carson scouts who were North Vietnamese that had converted over. They were, um, they came over to our side basically, and they were supposed to, you know, show us the way, teach mm -hmm. us about the jungle and uh, help us in our movement, which that was always a given yeah. as whether they were actually a help or a hindrance. So. Well, I was going to ask, did you trust them? I didn't, no, and most of the, most of the soldiers did not trust mm -hmm. them either. Um, they would not walk point. Um, you'd have to, you know, threaten them. And they knew enough English um, that 
when they didn't want to do something, you know, they'd act like they didn't understand. And that was one thing they surely didn't they acted mm -hmm. like they didn't understand was walking point. So did you have translators with your group? No, we did not. No translators at all. Mm -hmm. No. So did you find yourself confronting Viet Cong or North Vietnamese? We had both. Um, uh, most of our contacts were with the North Vietnamese Army. Uh, we did have some contact with um, the Viet Cong, but very little. They were operating more down south towards Saigon as opposed mm -hmm. to where we were. How far away were you from Saigon? Oh, gee, probably a good, I'm going to say 200 miles probably to the mm -hmm. north. And how far away from uh, the deep, uh, the line separating north and south Vietnam? Uh, that was probably about 40 miles away, the DMZ was. So. Mm -hmm. We never got up that far. That was I Corps. We didn't never operate mm -hmm. in I Corps. So, did the Marines operate anywhere near you? They were, um, they were in I Corps, and they were also down south. But I don't know specifically where they were. Mm -hmm. um, but we never came in contact with them. Mm -hmm. um, we would come in contact with South Vietnamese or um, South Koreans, uh, the Rocks, ROKs. Um, we would cross paths with them, but. You know, once again, we didn't speak their language, and mm -hmm. um, they didn't speak ours. So, were they? Uh, did you find them or think of them as good soldiers, or the, the Koreans? Yeah, um, they were tough. One thing they didn't do is they didn't clean up, you know, their area like we did. If we set out, you know, trip flares or you know, um, booby traps, we cleaned them, we policed them before we left. Obviously, um, they didn't. Um, they'd move out and. We find their stuff and trip flares. We trip them, but thank goodness we never ran into any of their, you know, detonating devices. Okay, so none yeah. of your group was injured by no, no. by them. Yeah. But uh, we only ran in contact with them, you know, two or three times that mm -hmm. I recall. So, how often did you find yourself in some sort of firefight with uh, the North? Oh, I'd say it was about weekly. We run into something. Um, it could be two days in a row, and then it could be. 30 days without anything. I mean, mm -hmm. that was rare, but you just never knew, um, you know, when it was going to happen, actually. So, mm -hmm. but there was always something going on uh, within the era we were mm -hmm. at, so. Did you have much uh, contact with the civilians? No, we were in what was called a free fire zone. So in a free fire zone, there were anything that moved was we could shoot because they knew they weren't allowed in there. They knew they couldn't be there or mm -hmm. else they would be shot, so. Um, so most of them would have moved away. They moved into in the villages down on the main highway where mm -hmm. they were allowed to stay. So um, we came in contact with mountain yards, though. We knew where the mountain yards were. They were the mountainous people. And uh, we would cordon our villages off for them if they, were, you know, if they had a threat. Um, but we knew where their villages were. They stayed within those villages, and they didn't travel much outside that area knowing that you know, could, they could get shot also. Now, did they consider themselves Vietnamese or are they something else? They did not get along with the Vietnamese, um, and it was vice versa. Uh, they're mountain people, uh, and they did not care for the South Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. They liked us, obviously, because we protect them, we fed them. Um, we brought our um, medics with us, and they would treat the children you know, for small things, mm -hmm. you know, cuts, bruises, whatever. But Now, during most of this, what rank were you? Um, I was a sergeant E-5. So I was a, um, a um, squad leader, then I was a platoon leader, and then um, our uh, radio operator got killed, so I became a radio operator for the company itself. So I was a company RTO for a while, and also a forward observer. Um, I did that, which was a, that was not an enlisted man's job, it was for um, you know officers, but sometimes you had to do what you had to do, so. How many people in the normal squad? Uh, there was eight to ten in the squad and um, 30 to 40 in the platoon. Mm -hmm. And you had four platoons. So. Now, when you became the radio man, you were with uh, the uh, company commander then? Yes, then I was with the company commander, right. So we traveled with a top sergeant, company commander, uh, medic, and a radio operator. Um, I think that's, I don't think there was anything else in the company mm -hmm. command, in that, in that command, so. Yeah, uh, what rank would the company commander be? Uh, captain. Mm -hmm. um, and you would have a first sergeant or second, or first lieutenant or second lieutenant that was in charge of each platoon. Mm -hmm. So you, you generally had four of those. 
plus a captain, and then top sergeant, which was probably an E8 or E9. Uh, is there any um, stories of an action or a, a particular conflict you feel like sharing? Um, well, there's quite a few. Some were funny, you know, some weren't so funny, obviously, when people get killed, but um, You know, uh, we got, I remember we got ambushed one time. I lost seven guys out of my squad. They weren't killed, thank God, but they were wounded seriously. Um, and that was on the side of a mountain. Um, but I think the more, the worst part about being in Vietnam wasn't necessarily the enemy. It was the weather, the bugs. The cold, um, not that the enemy wasn't your number one uh, problem, but we certainly, you know, endured a lot on that side that to this day I still think about it. But. Mm -hmm. Now, being uh, in country as much as you were, did your group have perhaps a different attitude or a different uh, look at things than, say, other groups in Vietnam at that time? You know, a lot of the guys that I knew um, that were over there didn't travel, I mean, didn't hump the jung jungle like we did. They would come back into a base camp at least maybe every other night, whereas we never did. Um, and that's how the 4th Infantry Division operated uh, when I was over there for, you know, that 10 months. Um, so we were, um, you know, constantly being on the move. You know, you had a lot of problems and illnesses and sicknesses and stuff like that that mm -hmm. couldn't be treated right away so I think a lot of those guys suffered you know a little bit more than the other mm -hmm. some of the guys that could go into base camp at night and have a hot meal mm -hmm. as an example so. did uh, was there any R&R &R during your 10 months yeah you had to you got one week R&R &R and um, um, guys would go to Hawaii if they were married because they couldn't beat their wives there um, or you could go to Japan, or you could go to Bangkok, um, Australia, were your options. So you'd be gone about 10 days total on that R&R. Mm -hmm. &R, so. Now, would they take simply a few people out of the unit, or would the whole unit? If, no, uh, it would be one or two guys at a time would leave, you know, three or four, you know, uh, at the most would leave at any given time. So mm -hmm. orders would come down and say, we have an opening for Japan, as an example. And if you wanted it, you you know, you would sign up and, mm -hmm. and then get out of the field uh, on a special, on a specific date, and then they get you back to the airport and away you went, so. Now, you say you got a week to, to do that, but how long would it take you to, to leave where you were <laughs> and actually enough. get? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not long enough. Yeah. Um, it, it, if you went in on a Monday, you would probably leave on a Wednesday, as an example. It would probably take two days to get to you know, mm -hmm. your orders. Um, and then get to the destination to take off and then get there and then come back, you know, take another two days once you got back into Vietnam. Mm -hmm. so. and, uh, Do you, you, when you often look at pictures of uh, those who fought in Vietnam, you, you, they sometimes seem to shed some of the military uniform or other things that they were having. Your unit out in the, uh, the, the jungle, if you will, or out in the, the wilderness, uh, did you decide, you know, uh, Oh, we don't need that. That's a waste of time to carry that around. Um, Clothes-wise, we did, we deleted stuff, but mm. um, uh, we generally didn't wear socks. Generally didn't wear underwear. Um, never wore white, obviously. Um, I remember one time my mom sent me a white T-shirt, and I <laughs> promptly threw that away. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that you'd stick out like a sore thumb on that mm. one. So, um, but no, ammunition-wise, we and even the heavy stuff. And we carried probably an average of about 80 pounds per man, mm -hmm. so every day. Uh, your load got lighter as you ate your sea rations, obviously, mm -hmm. but um, that was about the average weight we carried. So, mm -hmm. And everything we carried uh, was on our back, so everything we mm -hmm. needed was on our back. Now, you were 10 months in Vietnam. Correct. Uh, how long was your enlistment? Um, well, then it gets, uh, the Army came with an early drop uh, in 70, so I was... Um, um, I was at Valley Forge General Hospital because I had broken my ankle, and that's why I was only there 10 months and not um, 12 months. So I was hospitalized from March until August of 1970, and um, 
instead of you know serving out my three or four months that I still owed, they gave me what was called an early drop at that time. Um, and so I took it and out I went. So I only served 18 months in the Army. How did you break your ankle? Um, we were coming into a hot LZ. And, um, no, what's that now? Um, you're landing, we're going in by helicopter, and when you land on the um, LZ, the landing zone, um, the first bird in, whoever jumps off first, you have to pop smoke. So green meant go, red meant somebody's going to be shooting at you, or they are shooting at you. Well, mm -hmm. the idiot that went in, instead of popping green smoke, pops red smoke, and I'm on the fifth bird coming in. So as we're coming in, the door gunners on both sides open up with their machine guns because they saw the red smoke like I did. So um, I'm thinking at that time, we're getting shot at. <laughs> and you hear the whip of the blade and them shooting. And as we went in, he starts hovering instead of dropping. So we get to about 12 feet and I thought, I'm out of here. <laughs> so I jumped and unfortunately I landed on a stump about that big and broke my left ankle. So mm -hmm. fractured it. So. Next bird in, last bird in, threw me on it, and away I went. Mm -hmm. So I ended up at uh, Valley Forge General Hospital after that then. Now, how, well, how long did it take you to get to Valley Forge? Well, I got malaria on the way in. Um, when they brought me to, back to Fort Dix, um, uh, on the airplane I was feeling really bad. I was a medevac, and I felt bad, and there was a nurse on board, and I told her I was feeling bad. She gave me some medication of what it was, I don't recall. but. When I got back to Fort Dix, they put me on a, on a ward for fractures and broken bones, and um, I passed out and uh, hit my head, and they determined I had malaria. So, mm -hmm. so it took, uh, I didn't get to Valley Forge for two weeks, I guess it was. They held me there, mm -hmm. and then I went to um, Valley Forge for six months. Now, were you a sergeant at this time? Yeah, I was a sergeant at that time. Mm -hmm. right. so. Looking back at your service, so what do you think of it and the, the time you spent in the military? Yeah, it taught me a lot. Um, you know, I don't, think I, was, I don't think I was really responsible when I went in, you know, drinking and hanging out with the guys and doing things we do when you're 20 years old, 21. And, um, you know, I learned... You gotta look out for yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's a cool world out mm -hmm. there, and um, you lean on each other, your friends, uh, your buddies, um, and I still have friends that were in with me to this day. So, mm -hmm. so you're still in contact with many of the people? Not many, a few. Okay. Um, uh, I went to Elder High School, and a lot of those individuals were in Vietnam also, and we get together at least twice a year, uh, even though they were in a different company or division. We still share the stories. Mm -hmm laugh about the old stories and bring up new ones. How'd you feel about coming back to the United States when your service was up? Was there a, a different attitude that you had or people had toward you? We knew coming back, it, you know, we had heard the stories about the problems. Um, when I came back, I didn't see that. Um, I, I knew it was written about in Stars and Stripes newspaper. We knew what was going on. Um, I didn't see that. But um, I really never wore my uniform. I, it, it wasn't that I was ashamed. I just didn't. I was conflicted. I think mm -hmm. you know, knowing we really didn't shouldn't have been there. But you know, mm -hmm. I felt it was my duty. And I had uncles, and my dad were all in World War II, so um, felt like they did their job. I guess I should do mine. So today, we often see in the in the news how uh, people react so much differently from soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, when you see that in the news and how uh, they're thanked so much today that compared to when you were uh, in the service, how does that make you feel? Um, I'm glad they do that for those individuals and you know I know those guys suffered just like we did so it's kind of a camaraderie, you know, we're all in it together and mm -hmm. I understand what they did. I hope they understand what I did. Um, they may be in the desert, I was in the jungle. Mm -hmm. you know, um, they ate the same things I ate, mm -hmm. suffered the same weather we suffered, so the wet and the heat, the bugs, so. Um, 
I'm glad, you know, we are where we are today in that respect, but mm -hmm. it didn't really bother me. It doesn't. Okay. Uh, overall, do you look at your military service as a positive part of your life? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, even going to Vietnam, even seeing what I saw, um, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything, love or money. It was just and why so wouldn't you trade it? It was such a. I, it was a great experience. I mean that, not the killing, none of that. That there was nothing great about that. Um, it, it was just that it, it made you a man. Or it gave you respect for your fellow man. He leaned on me. I leaned on him. Um, we knew what we had to do. We did it. It wasn't easy sometimes, and I'm not proud of some of the things we had to do. But um, they weren't illegal. But they they still bother me to this day. You know that. But. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for sharing your story. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was on, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs>